Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Gregory Benford, um, who is a famous science fiction writer and a real life scientist, and um, has done lots of other cool things that it would take me way too long to enumerate. But um, today, he's going to talk about um, selection and genomics and uh, longevity research. So without further ado. Thank you. I, uh, I'm happy to be here. I've been to Google before, enjoyed the science food this summer. And I'm here to talk, uh, not in my role, uh, actually in my hobby as a science fiction writer, although I would point out, uh, is there anyone in the audience who's ever written a grant proposal? You too are science fiction writers. <laughs> Perhaps not as well paid, but, uh, but that's it. About 10 years ago, uh, an elderly woman was interviewed on television. And uh, the uh, interviewer said, uh, what's the best thing about being 104 years old? And she thought for a moment and then said very decisively, no peer pressure. <laughs> <laughs> the point about Genesian, the goal, is to make that little joke obsolete <laughs> by using the methods which you people know very well. IT methods, and a very well-known thing a present in, the, in, in our scientific world for a very long time, which has, however, not been widely used, natural selection, although actually Genesian Corporation uses artificial selection. And the artificial uh, aspect of it, why is my slide not jumping? <laughs> Hitting this, or, ah, okay, didn't get after it, here, let me go back, is, is to note that, in a sense, natural selection, of course, has been acting on the human population for a very long time. As you can see from this data, which I harvested from many sources, um, the species has had a hard time of it. It's amazing that we've gotten this far in so relatively little time, roughly 100,000 years, because in prehistory, it was a very tough job to get out of adolescence. You know, that is, to, to actually get to reproduce. And that's really the point. Natural selection acts up until the time you stop reproducing. And beyond that point, it has no way to convey information forward into an organism because you, you cannot carry forward to the next generation. And for us, that means roughly age 40, although it's age 40 for women, but not for men, which leads to an, another topic entirely. But notice, for example, that the big change in the civilization has been to slowly get rid of early childhood mortality, as you can see from the difference data between, say, Mexico and India. That is dependent on what culture you were in. So at about the same time, it was better to be in Mexico uh, than in India because you were making at least some uses of new technologies. And right now, the mean lifespan in the United States is uh, roughly 78, 79. And so you can imagine what is the best present possible. That's that curve that essentially ends at 100. But the world record in longevity is uh, a French woman who lived to 122, died a few years ago, and once sold pencils to Van Gogh. I think that's a great way to pin how much experiments, experience she's had. And so it's worth asking, uh, how, how much longer can this go on? Well, the evidence we have from the Methuselah flies, which Genesian Corporation has developed and owns, is that it can go a great deal longer. I compiled this data from the US Census Bureau, and it tells you something interesting about just the last century. You'll notice that uh, the top curve, by the way, the yellow, is uh, mean lifespan for women in the United States for the 20th century, and below it is men. Notice that big downward jog around 1918, 1919. That's the Spanish influenza. It had a really big effect. But more importantly, look at all the data leading up to about 1940. There are all these ripples with a periodicity of rough periodicity of about four years. 
they were propagating forward these bulges in the population and changes in longevity from many plagues that had occurred in the 19th century. And you'll notice that the whole curve starts to smooth out around 1940. That's the advent of what I think of as truly modern medicine, penicillin, vaccines, and you'll notice that all those oscillations went away. Meanwhile, a steady progression upward and the longevity of women has consistently ranked higher, and in fact, it's increased until very recent times steadily also, versus men. So you can learn a lot, a great deal about the impact of technology just looking at data like this. But I just gave this talk at the Singularity Summit in Manhattan, and, and, and uh, there are a lot of people there who expect the singularity to change everything in human society, and I would hope longevity, but there's this problem, what I call the gap problem, <laughs> is that you have to get to the singularity to enjoy its benefits. And for some of us, that's a significant issue because when Ray Kurzweil, and I asked him again last weekend, you know, what's your best date for singularity? And he said, well, maybe 2045. And, and then he proudly said, and I take over 200 supplements a day to be sure that I get there. And I said, Ray, you know, we've spoken this before, but you, you realize, you know, you only got two kidneys and one liver. <laughs> and, and you got to worry about stressing these systems. But in more general terms, I think it's really worth saying that the, what we now have to do is use the greatest tools that have ever come into the hands of biologists, and that's the ability to truly read the genomics of both ourselves and other species. That's an enormous advantage, and it's only been around a decade. So this is just the beginning in which we are turning on the flashlight in a room that's always been dark to, to the biologists and everyone else, and try to understand what we find there and to affect what we change there. But you've got to be careful that you don't use the wrong technology in the wrong setting. I love this this cover because I actually saw it on this issue of Astounding SF. Um, seizing a spaceship in the future, right? Taking your own computational ability along. <laughs> now, the, the problem is you, you couldn't make this same visual analogy anymore because what would he have between his teeth? Not the simulated dagger that pirates famously carried in their mouths to come aboard. It would be a hard drive or something. Uh, I, I mean, it, the visual imagery wouldn't work, but you do have to be careful to not take the modes of thinking about technologies forward into a changed world. And so what Genesian has done is take the Methuselah flies, which are developed by Michael Rose, who is a professor at UC Irvine, just as I am, uh, who came from Canada personally owning, owning the flies he had already developed for over a decade by a simple method. He took Drosophila, fruit flies, and would put them in cages 500 at a time. So the, the populations were huge, 10,000 flies, so that they do not become inbred. When you hear mouse results, for example, in medicine, Almost all mouse experiments are deeply inbred, and so you have to question how relevant they are to us because if, you know, we have many bad qualities, but one of our best biological qualities is that we're outbred. That is to say, we don't carry forward pernicious genes in the population. It can always be factored out. And so we have a wide range of genomics, and therefore, by the way, a wide range in mortality. So, Michael continued this. In 2006, when I and a co-investor bought these flies and founded Genesian, they lived to be four and a half times longer than ordinary flies. They had gone through over 700 generations of forced, that is artificial, selection. Since then, by the way, I've, uh, since uh, I was the CEO and I'm now the chairman of the board, I simply took another population and had the lab people accelerate the force of natural selection by removing the, the eggs after 75% of the population was dead, still keeping enough flies to have them be outbred. And those flies now live five and a half times longer than control flies. What were the genomic implications of all that? Nobody knew because 
the genomics had never been done. Only a decade before, it would have been hopelessly expensive to do so. But we managed to do it for just a few hundred thousand dollars and analyzed it in detail. And, uh, and it's, one way of talking about this is to say you're, it's, it's fairly easy using old methods to illuminate simple biological mechanisms. But the really big problem is that the genomic networks illuminated over the last decade, and particularly by the Methuselah flies, are incredibly complicated. So they become an information technology problem. And one of the problems of biology is that it typically didn't have a lot of IT people on hand. So in fact, we've been bringing IT people in, not just Genesian, but everybody, in order to try to figure out all these pathways. Because what these results show, and I'll go into more detail in a moment, is that longevity is a very general trait. And there are many pathworks, uh, pathways involved. And in the Methuselah flies versus the control flies, we found that many, many had been used. And certain genes and SNPs, that's single nucleotide polymorphisms, emerged as really outstanding. But there were a lot of contributors. So it's, it's a very complicated problem because evolution does not have to do things in simple, elegant ways. It can do them, because it has an infinite budget, essentially, it can do them as it likes. And it can do them all simultaneously. Evolution acts upon suites of genes, not just one or two. And so there's no miracle solution. There's no gene that's going to suddenly make you double your life, expected lifespan. And the thing is about these networks is that they really are large. Networks involving tens of thousands of SNPs. And the way to understand this from the IT perspective would be to just do an enormous, an enormous study and a lot of code. But of course, the nice thing about science is that you can do experiments. And so what we've really done is illuminate this problem with an algorithm that is artificial selection. And it took a lot of time. It took over 30 years for Michael Rose to develop these long live flies. There are no such other organisms in the world. No flies, no mice, nothing. And therefore, it's the unique case. No one had the patience to do this over decades. And that's also why we have an enormous advantage. We've got the information, and it's not going to be easy to get it in any other way. It's worth remembering, though, that remember that rep reproduction and the end of reproduction marks the closure of information propagating forward into the next generation. So if you keep moving reproduction forward, that is to say, you select for the flies that can re reproduce later, because after all, if you wait until half are dead, only the long live are going to be able to reproduce then you can continue to, to shed the genetic modifications that shorten your lifespan. So that if you can imagine this yellow box, a reproduction, sliding in that direction, then the downward arrows, which are the bad genomic symbols, uh, signals, that is, they are bad for us or bad for any organism, the communication of those into the next generation gets pushed further and further out so that only the, uh, the, 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 the children of the long live flies are more robust and function better. And so that's the key to getting an advanced lifespan. And of course, this is not a new idea. I'm known as a science fiction writer, but the actual idea behind this was proposed by Robert Heinlein in Methuselah's Children a novel in the 1940s. Uh, and I, I talked to Heinlein, who's a friend of mine, about this. And uh, he said, you know, I hope it could be done in a few centuries. But we now know, actually, just from the, the simple uh, data from the flies, that a few generations is not going to do it. Ten generations gives you an increase in lifespan in a range of some percent, a few percent, but not 100%. And, and so you can't wait for that. It would take, I calculated, 17,000 years to do this to humans, but you could do it to flies, and we have. So what did we learn from the Methuselahs? 
Well, it's actually all good news. <laughs> there was a novel in the 1930s by Aldous Huxley called After Many a Summer Dies a Swan, in which all the way through, you know that there's, there's some people who have managed to live a long time. And he finally meets them, the protagonist, and he discovers that they are in terrible shape. They're weak, fragile, huddled over, not really enjoying life, but they're going to live longer. <clears throat> the Methuselahs have taught us <clears throat> that none of that's true. The Methuselah flies, and we actually measure these things. There are biologists who spend, <laughs> working for us, who do all this kind of thing. They never do. Uh, <laughs> that the Methuselahs have more sex throughout their lives, although they start reproducing a little later than the other ones, and then reproduce much longer. They lay more eggs as a result of that, and they're more vigorous. And if you put them in a cage with the control flies, they beat them up. I mean, look, they outcompete them. You can actually measure this quantitatively because the flies have to do, the males must do a mating dance, right? In order to get to fertilize the female. So you see, it's just like us. And you can measure how good they are at it. And you can tell when they're going to die because they can no longer do the mating dance. And, and the interesting thing is, in the population curve, that they, the, 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 the Methuselah flies have a long plateau toward the last third of their lives. And then they fall flat off the plateau. If they stop doing the mating dance, they will be dead in a day. So in a way, perhaps it isn't also like us. And so this is what a kind of population curve looks like toward the last portions, they have better lives, not worse lives. And so if we can harness this information, and we have, then we can go forward to a world in which you will not only live longer, but you'll live better. What is the vertical scale of this curve? That's the survival percentage starts at 100, drops to zero. So that's the same population curve I show you for humans, but this is for flies. So what we did is read the genomics of the flies. And using expression analysis, we found about 1,000 changes that were plainly to a high probability by that, I mean, a probability better than one chance. Uh, uh, well, the, 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 the chances that are you're wrong are less than one in 1,000. We impose that standard. We have a, a bunch of things that are good to one in 100, which would be extremely good in, in other kinds of biology. But we insisted on a standard in which you absolutely know that these things are implied in longevity. That is compared to the control flies. We found, found about 1,000 of those. And we then, from this gene expression, we compared with humans. I mean, the standard question we always get is, why should I care about the lifetime of flies? In fact, I, I like to kill all the flies in my house. <laughs> Actually, that happened to me because the, for the first two months of the, of the company, while we were looking around for a place to put a lab, we kept the flies in my house and we did a genomic analysis on them there. Um, we shipped it off actually to Affymetrix to, to, to use their half a billion SNP, a half a million SNP uh, codes. But several of them got out. So we, when we moved the flies to the lab, there were about half a dozen Methuselahs left. And you could tell if a Methuselah came into the room. I'd be sitting there reading, and I'd hear this faint little buzzing. I mean, how many times do you hear a fly buzzing across the room? And they would buzz around, and I, I, I'd try to swat them, and I couldn't hit them. They were so fast. They could get away. They were good at everything. We had to wait until they died. We actually never successfully killed a single one. So to me, that was impressive. I mean, I, never mind the genomics. On real things that I care about, they were good. So in this, we were, we were then looking at why should we care about flies when we really are concerned about humans? And the, and the answer is that the flies were the template that evolution worked out to do things that we do all the time. We separated, I mean, the sense that that makes sense, separated from the, from the fly 600 million years ago. So it's been a long time in production. Well, what do they do for a living? They eat sugar and they fly around. <laughs> so they die of type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular problems, and interestingly to us, when we mapped it into the human genome, we found that they had a lot of neurological problems. 
And so, in fact, we harvested and have patented in our methods patent and elsewhere genes which nobody else knows that are associated with Parkinson's, Huntington's, and Alzheimer's. And we check those against other human databases, too, and it holds up. So they, the Methuselahs, have the ability to defend their bodies against these disorders. And we know what those genes are. You got a question? Yes. It sounds like you were uh, amplifying the selective pressure, but still selecting only for things that uh, would have been selected for in their natural environment. So given that they've been in that natural environment for vastly more generations than your experiment, uh, why, I mean, was there anything maladaptive in what you were selecting for? And if not, why did you get results that many more generations of evolution in their natural environment did not get? And uh, just to, to, to uh, um, extend the question, um, uh, since some flies did escape, uh, is there any evidence that those flies are displacing uh, the regular flies in the natural habitat? Well, we don't know about any of the Methuselahs who ever escaped, but remember, they were still in my house. But no, uh, why, why, why doesn't everything live infinitely long, right? I mean, how come natural selection doesn't? Because there is always a trade-off. Uh, remember in high school when uh, the football guy got all the girls? Well, he was trading off benefits here, right? Actually, I happen to know who, uh, who the, uh, I used to play high school football, and Four or five of the guys who were on my team are already dead, right? They've been selected out. Uh, um, they were really great in their teenage years. But there's always a selection for early reproduction. But we removed that. We got rid of the early reproducers. So we specifically selected for longevity. And that's why nature doesn't do it, because it always favors the young and quick. Did the, were, the, were the late reproducers less good at early reproduction? Uh, Yes, they okay. write. The Methuselahs do not reproduce as early as ordinary flies. That's also true, you will notice, of everyone who goes to universities. <laughs> In fact, when you think about it, the university system is selecting for longevity. <laughs> so you've already gotten the benefit. My parents actually didn't go to university, so there you go. I grew up in southern Alabama on a farm. Um, so, so that was a very good question because it illuminates why this could emerge and did not in nature. Although there are extremely long lived species. The sea turtles live well over a century. And of course we know of trees that live, that were alive and they're in California at the time of Christ. So, what we really learned, and, and this was an open question until we actually did this genomic mapping, is that these genes are salient in our longevity. So these homologs from the flies to us are extremely useful genetic medical information. And when I say that we, we found, say, some, uh, <clears throat> some Parkinson's genes, we got a large number of the genes associated with Parkinson's in humans that are known, but we also got those that are not known. And that's the key. We, we just got more genes than you can pull out of raw human data. We went to the uh, Wellcome Trust genomic information, which is now publicly available. It took us half a, month, a year to get it because they were very edgy about giving it to a company. You know, they, you know the Europeans, they're suspicious of profit. And, and we found that we could go in there and pull information out of their database that they cannot because we have a signal to noise filter. We had the roughly 1,000 SNPs to look for and say, how does this correlate in this 16,000 patient inventory? And so we could find things that they could not. And that's another use of this kind of method. You eliminate a lot of noise this way. So what we've done is use selection as a supercomputer to pull long live genes out of another species. And then we did the next thing, because uh, I and my co-founder, who was a, uh, an Italian, a brilliant Italian woman named Christina Riza, um, who's a cardiovascular specialist, 
decided that we were not going to turn this into just a diagnostic company because, frankly, I'd been noticing that I wasn't getting any younger. <laughs> and that's my motive. I don't need money. I've got lots of money. So we immediately began a program in which, since we know these genes, we had biochemists and biologists work backward through the genetic pathways to find substances that can act to upregulate the genes that people already have that defend against these diseases. And by upregulate, I mean you stimulate it with these particular chemicals so that the gene fun functions at a higher level. That, it took a while to figure out this, and we learned a lot about why the FDA is, in some ways, a block to progress. Because, as you all know, it takes about a decade to develop a pharmaceutical. But there's a hole in the whole method. All the traditional medicines of India, China, other places have been grandfathered in to the American pharmacopoeia. They are called the grass substances, generally recognized as safe because they've been used in China for 5,000 years, et cetera. So we went into that suite, which is thousands of substances. We found those that our own analysis said could upregulate the genes, and then we tested them on lab animals, particularly flies. Well, it's been done on mice. And we then resolutely marched through dozens of these things and found out if we could increase the lifetime of control flies by simply giving them these substances in their foods. It's a direct experiment done to the tune of tens of thousands of flies. So you get lots of nice data. That's another problem with human genome stuff. It's a big deal and it takes a lot of time and money to get a 10,000 human genomic analyses done. But of course, we, what we did was simply force or through the experiment, force flies to uh, force the substances we chose to see if the flies could in fact live longer, and we looked at side effects. Did they reproduce? Because in fact, some of the substances, yeah, they'll extend lifespan, but they don't reproduce. Uh, when you look at studies of C. elegans and places and stuff like that, such as is done near here in San Francisco, oh uh, yeah, they live longer, and they lie in the bottom of the cage, and they don't do anything else. <laughs> It's easy to sedate animals and make them live longer. Calorie restriction does the same thing. Calorie restriction has many good things about it, I suppose. But I knew Roy Walford, who died some years ago, uh, for over 20 years. And he's once when he had a, a drink, one drink. <laughs> if you don't drink much, one drink will reveal a lot. And he said, you know, I really want to live longer, but I really do miss sex. <laughs> I really do miss vigor and so forth and so on. Well, I'm just not willing to make that bargain. But we found that some substances will knock the flies down and let them live longer, but they don't do anything else. And so we looked at the mating assays, the fecundity, and the vigor analysis, and we only kept those things that would increase lifespan and let the flies remain vigorous, because that's another clue. Methuselahs remain vigorous. So we wanted to look at that narrower suite of substances that can do that. And, and we've now found quite a few. Uh, our lead product, which will be out next year, increases the control fly lab span by 30%. It's good to five standard deviations. Uh, we have others, combinations of single substances. Uh, but, and that's what nature hasn't done, is that we take several of these things and put them together, you see, which doesn't occur in Chinese medicine, but it's OK, because individually, they're all in the grass category and see what they do to lifespan. And we've got about, at the moment, half a dozen that can increase the lifespan over 20%. We think we know what the leader does. We think it's a repair mechanism uh, from research other people have done. So we're pursuing two different things. We're going to, we're going to sell what we call nutrigenomic agents. I mean, we know these act on these genes that are associated with longevity. And in the first suite, First six, it's all cardio. I mean, it undoubtedly does some other things, just as the statin drugs do. And uh, I've been taking the statin drugs, so I'm going to live forever, right? So we ah, stopped. Whoop, nope. Signature problem. We've uh, we've consistently tried to find the substances that will do all of those major functions 
And we know, in this case, what they're doing. They're operating on the cardiovascular system. Why? Because over half of all deaths in the advanced human population are from cardiovascular problems. So we're now going to march on to diabetes, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and Huntington's, and some others that are lesser. So what's the moral of the story? Um, we're not operating on single genes. We're operating on networks of genes. So it's not a quick fix. And the age-dependent disorders, particularly heart disease, are central to all of this. So we've actually gone ahead and done other things to do this. Um, we look at side effects re resolutely, male mating, mating uh, success, and also, by the way, the resistance to infection. In fact, I'll show you a little data. Here's a heart pacing experiment in which this is the percent, percentage of heart failures. And basically what it's, it's saying is that uh, B in this notation means ordinary flies and O means Methuselah flies, O for older. These, this is the heart attack rate. We actually have developed ways of giving hearts, uh, the hearts of flies, attacks, give them fibrillation by electrical current, and, and you look at the heart and count its pace, pacing and look for other disorders, and you find out how the fly performs after a heart attack. In other words, the ability to survive a heart attack. And we've been able to show that the Methuselahs are much better at surviving heart attacks, which is actually going to happen to a large number of people. Half of those who have heart attacks die in the first heart attack. If you can make it through the first, well, it's certainly a good idea, but so we specifically looked at that ability. And we showed that this is true of the Methuselahs to a, a probability which of, of better than 5% by a chi-squared test. So we actually know that the Methuselahs could survive heart attacks better. And we also know, this is sepsis, that, we, we, that fly, these flies are better at surviving infection. Now, it will have occurred to you already that since, and, and you could just study this data here, uh, for example, uh, this, is, this has not been published yet, but uh, the survival of the Methuselahs is about 50% better for given infections. It will have occurred to you, though, that you can take the flies that survive and use those as a selection protocol. This gentleman asked, you know, so you selected for longevity, what else do you get? Well, you can also select for survival of infection or survival of heart attacks. And that's another selection mechanism that will illuminate different pathways in different ways. And so it's not just one thing you can do with, with these. You can force it, the, the force of natural, of artificial selection to give you information, and then you can use that in the laboratory. That's the long-term prospect. We're, we're not going to start stop just with longevity. We're going to look at survival from the insults, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune that occur to all humans. Um, now, so what about you? I mean, you're all young, hopelessly young. Uh, <laughs> but uh, and so the, uh, the, first, the best point is, is take care of yourself. <laughs> Delay as long as possible your need for these kinds of mechanisms. But that's not available to me. I've already uh, managed to get old. So uh, my second piece of advice to you is don't do it like Ray Kurzweil. He's a very sharp guy, good friend of mine. But don't overload your system with a whole lot of supplements, because one thing we found from our experiments is that occasionally we would take separate substances that extend the lifespan, say three or four of them, we'd combine them, and you'd get a negative effect. And so we've done dosage studies, and we found that some of these things are good in this wing, have no effect over here, and are negative over here. By the way, I would mention to you that there is a large negative region, and we tested this on the flies, for caffeine. Ring any bells? <laughs> we found that at large overload, uh, say equivalent to about 10 cups of coffee a day, we, the flies have a reduced lifespan. Now, that's not an open and shut argument, but uh, I don't drink a lot of coffee anymore. 
In fact, every biologist in the company stopped drinking coffee. And we stopped giving away coffee in the corporate lab after this result. And we published this three months ago. So what Genesis is looking for is stuff that works, really works. And our, our intention is to carve out of the, the marble that genomics has, we'll carve out something useful and beautiful by using first under learning and then using the genomic pathways that are, that are available. And all of this is using adaptive selection. Force the animals to select, to, through forced selection, artificial selection, to tell you information and then use that in the laboratory. And we call that evolutionary nutrigenomics. The nice thing about it is that you can sell these on the market. You do not require human trials beyond safety trials, which we're doing right now. And I should probably advertise that. I've been taking our number one substance for half a year, and I've seemed to be reasonably alive, and, uh, and then deploy it in a market mechanism. So this, by the way, I won't read it to you, is a summary of the, what I think we've accomplished by direct application and shown in the laboratory so far. And then I'll have a couple of... Yeah, I'll just let you read that for a moment. Meanwhile, I'll answer a question. Could you elaborate a little bit more on your human testing? Could on the you elaborate what? a little bit more on your human safety testing? Oh, you give it to a small group, a few dozen people, and uh, look at their basic performance things. What's the blood pressure? How do you? The most important is how do you feel? Do you feel better? Worse? You know? Do you have depressed thoughts? No suicides? I mean. <laughs> Basics like that, that's all the FDA requires, by the way. Or actually, the FDA doesn't even require that for supplements, which may shock some of you, shock me. Yeah, but that's a shame that they don't require it for substances, right? I mean, Your government at work. People without controls for, controls for you know, Yeah. Uh, well, effects. you see, the grass substances are generally accepted as safe because they've been used. Yeah. And so, no, it's not obviously bad for you, like, say, chocolate. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's a joke. Chocolate, actually... Theobromine bromine, is good for you. I, I, it's actually good <laughs> to, to eat chocolate, which amazed me. So here's a kind of a final conclusion. Uh, I'm a physicist. I'm a professor of physics at UC Irvine. But uh, we're already in the next century, and it's obviously one that's going to be about biology, also about climate change, but not, that's another talk. Um, and we now know that biology is from fundamentally an information problem. That's where you can get the most illumination. And that we have uh, then begun using selection and genomics to pull this information out. Um, and so what we're trying to do is start a health revolution that is based on a new technology and a new way of looking at the world so that we can all advance. Because that event that occurred back around 1940 in which we ironed out the longevity curve and we, we entered the era of modern medicine is just the beginning. Here's a new technology, beyond, way beyond what vaccines can do, that we can use to advance our prospects. In that case, and, and these are our collaborating institutions, we hope to have a future in which you can greatly increase human longevity. In that opening slide, when I said, you know, maybe we can live to be 150, I think that's actually going to be true. I think it's quite plausible that people will live to be 200, 300, but it's also quite possible that people who will live to be 150 are in this audience right now. Because we've actually managed with other techniques, both in the 19th and the 20th century, to increase the mean longevity in the advanced society by 50% each time. You know what the mean longevity was at the time of Thomas Jefferson? It was about 40. The mean longevity at the time of Jesus Christ was 30. So he had 32 when he died on the cross. He was actually a little beyond the mean. <laughs> I mean, you don't think about that, but imagine a society in which people live to be only 30. Wait, you don't have to imagine it. It's in the Bible, right? Which is obsessed with the afterlife. Guess what? It was going to happen next week. But what about a society in which people live to be 150? I don't think it's an accident that the environmentalism, for example, has occurred in the last century. The national parks are only a bit more than 100 years old. Uh, why? Because people were living long enough to see the results. And they could see the rate of change. Other concerns about climate change in this century. And even things like, say, archaeology. Uh, how come archaeology is not a thousand-year-old subject? How come it's only since the time of Schliemann? 
two centuries ago. Well, it's because people didn't have enough of a perspective to even think about the ancient past. It seems irrelevant because, after all, they were going to die pretty soon. It's worth imagining what's going to happen to a society in which people will live to be 150. I think they're going to have a much longer time frame in mind. And as you probably notice, our major problems are on that time scale. Climate change is a problem for the, for a, on the scale in, of a century, because by that time we'll see at least two, I think more like four degrees centigrade, change in the temperature of the planet, unless we do things like geoengineering, which I've been working on. But the point is, this is inherently a long time scale problem. If you make people live longer, you will get more wisdom out of the society. And of course, you'll get more productivity, because people won't be retiring at the age of 65. <clears throat> no need to. No need to at all. They will work all the way past 100, and you'll get much more yield out of them. After all, you spend, what, 20 years educating people, and then you get 30 years of work, and they're gone? That's not a really great way to run a society. If you get a century more out of them, it's far more productive. Worth remembering that 65 was the retirement age in Social Security for, and it's set up in 1936. You know why? Because at that point, half the people were dead. So you could fund the program on the backs of everybody, but give it to only half. Uh, it's worth remembering how, that your perspective changes with your lifespan. So that's the Genesian agenda. Uh, that's what we want to do. And, uh, and the company is growing very fast. Um, and it's a perfect example of how people like you, who are in IT, can help fields that seem utterly different, utterly different. But longevity is, in fact, your kind of problem. So get to work on it. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I noticed in the uh, in the infection study that you had actually shown the age of the flies when you tested them, but in the uh, closer to the mic. Yeah, in the uh, study for the substances, the nutrigenomics you didn't show at which age you started uh, giving these substances to the flies. So I'm wondering, you know, when you transfer that to humans whether it applies to how early in life you have to start taking this uh, nutrigenomics to have an effect? Uh, uh, how early should you begin taking a genomically derived nutrigenomic? Um, because after all, you don't need it when you're a, just a snot-nosed kid, right? Well, um, a rough measure is you should take it after the age in which human reproduction stops, which is roughly 40. By the way, uh, my co-founder, the cardiovascular specialist, gives all of her patients the statin drugs at age 40 because it is essentially a longevity drug in itself. It's really great for cardiovascular. It drops the, the death rate from cardio problems by 45%, one drug, right? But it also reduces the cancer death rate by 20% and the Alzheimer's rate. So it's a very general kind of thing. But she gives them to it at age 40 for exactly that reason. And by the way, the actual data shows that it works, even in that low an age. So 40, I would say. But of course, there's no real problem with taking it earlier, because it has no bad side effects. Yes? Uh, flies to humans seems like an awful big jump. Have you thought about uh, adding in testing on mice as an intermediate yeah. stuff? Every yes, everybody says, why didn't you do it in mice? Well, two things. The control flies we use, who live in big environments under a significant stress, they live three, four weeks, right? Mice live several years. So it's going to take you much longer to get so profound a result. But there's another problem. All lab mice are inbred. So you're looking at a narrow suite of genes. These are not natural mice. Third, mice die mostly of can cancer. And cancer is a worthy topic. But that's all you're going to get, mostly, is cancer. Uh, so those are the reasons we haven't done mice. Uh, it's far more expensive. But we are, in fact, carrying forward such a program now. It's just that uh, flies look like the low-hanging fruit, if that's a metaphor, because they are fruit flies, right? <laughs> so as you say, you get uh, very fast results from breeding flies and testing on mice is very expensive, and it takes a really long time to get any useful data. 
um, and then you are going to go and you're going to sell these to humans. And um, to actually do a double-blind trial of humans taking these for long enough to demonstrate a life-extending effect mm -hmm. would take a really long time. So is it going to take 40 years before we're, we can tell whether you're actually selling anything useful? Yes. I mean, the problem with affecting human longevity is it takes a while. Uh, and 40 years, it would be nice to have a, a program that, that would yield a result in 40 years, but where do you get the funding? Um, so uh, we hope that half a century from now it will be clear that these things illuminate human longevity, but no one will know, as you say, until we get that far. Are the there, problem is that it, most people are rather impatient. Are there <laughs> beneficial effects that you could test for uh, that you could do on a, on a one-year trial or a six-month trial where you could say, well, look, this person's cardiovascular health is improved by taking these things, because then it would, it would seem uh, to give much more confidence. That's really good. Are, do you, are you interested in a job? Because, <laughs> no, thanks. I'm good. Because that's exactly what we're doing. We're uh, looking at their general overall performance versus time, and uh, much too early to say anything, except that I can tell you personally, I've been taking it for half a year, and I think it improves your, uh, your energetic levels. And I think we actually know why. Uh, so, yes, we're going to look at people's basic performance over time. Uh, longevity takes a, bit, a good deal longer. Thanks. <laughs> so have you tried giving these um, you know, cocktails of you know, chemicals to the Methuselah flies and seeing if it actually helps them? Uh, yes, but I can't tell you any results because we don't have them yet. Uh, that's exactly what we're doing an experiment right now. <laughs> yeah, he was, you're right. You're looking for a job? No. Uh, <laughs> you've got a good job. Maybe in 50 years. It's a great years. place to work. <laughs> so provided that um, the project uh, comes to fruition and you are able to extend human life, I know, several uh, times uh, in length, how uh, do you think it will affect the uh, creativity in the uh, in the society? Because ideas, um, mostly the youth, um, young people, are the uh, source of new ideas in the in the society. And uh, in a society that has people living much longer uh, but still resource constrained, there will be very few uh, youngsters. Uh, that, that's essentially a, a, a social question. It says, suppose you create a long-lived society. Well, actually, you know, I would say, yeah, we'll worry about that when we get one, but uh, I, won't the creativity go away? Um, two things. One, I think the lapsing of creativity occurs at least in part because of the lapsing of vigor in the human population. On the other hand, it's also true that Leo Tolstoy wrote Anna Karenina when he was in his 70s. I mean, there is some creativity late in life. It tends to be places where accumulated wisdom helps you, particularly novelists. And uh, Beethoven wrote the Ninth Symphony when he was in his 50s. Uh, uh, but but that's, that is an interesting implication. Uh, of course, it doesn't mean you won't have young people around. Um, it may, may be that you'll have a wiser society, which if you know much of this history of the 20th century, it might suggest itself as a good idea. So uh, those social implications are going to be worked out by, oh, that's right, you guys. <laughs> you guys, because you're going to see it. Uh, and you can even live to sing the sing singularity. Yeah, right. Yes, you'd, yeah, let's hope it's selecting for something more than just long life. That's probably going to be a much more conservative society. Um, Will it be more conservative? <laughs> you, you mean it will do less, or it will be more cautious? Uh, it will be more averse to change. Oh. Um, will it be? Mm. But wait a second. The societies Whether with the longest live people in it have been the mo uh, uh, those who had the greatest rate of change, that is, the societies of the last 200 years. So it, the historical experience is it goes the other way. You want a conservative society? Think about the pharaohs, right? Very little happened for over a thousand, you know, a couple of thousand years. That's a conservative society. Uh, so I don't think it's obvious that these societies will be averse to change because 
the rate of change in the last two centuries has been the highest in human experience. And it's also those, the one in which people live longer. So it's not a, an obvious issue. Thanks. Um, so uh, my understanding is that, say, five years from now, we're going to have huge amounts of genomic data for you know hundreds of thousands or millions of volunteers correlated with their medical records. Um, uh, so I'm assuming at that point you could take your fruit fly genes and look at the million volunteers and see if there was a correlation where the ones, the humans who live longer had these genes also. Is that in the playbook? That's that's exactly what's going to happen. And in fact, the, they're the, uh, uh, the centenarians, is that it is called? The centenarians, a, a group, those who live longer than 100, uh, they're growing, they're the fastest growing group of the population. <laughs> <laughs> and so, exactly, there's a whole ready a society that studies this genomically and tries to pull information out of it. By the way, the Methuselahs show a, a plateau in late life. So do the centenarians. Those beyond 105, the rate of mortality, uh, the, the mortality rate is flat. It does not continue to increase. In the human population, mortality rate increases all the way up to 105 and then plateaus. Exactly the same thing as the Methuselahs do, which is very suggestive that longevity means both vigor of a sort and that the mortality rate stops declining. So that's very suggestive, and that's exactly what's going to happen in the next decade. Yes, So, sir. so I'm over 40. Uh, what do you suggest I take now? So you're over 40. Um, take, take statin drugs, regular exercise. All the things that our mothers told us turn out to be true. Isn't that embarrassing? <laughs> I mean, eat vegetables and fruits, and the usual stuff. Do not take up hang gliding as I did. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I broke this shoulder twice, once in baseball and once in, once in surfing. And it's my spine in surfing, my ankles in mountain climbing. Uh, don't do those things. <laughs> I stopped laying off that stuff about the age of 45 to 50. Um, otherwise, uh, oh, yes, that's right. Buy our nutrigenomics. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, thanks very much. <laughs>